useful just uh, to start off by reminding you uh, of where we are in Marx's grand project, which is to understand the circulation and accumulation of capital in general uh, in the three volumes of capital. And if we go back to this diagram, uh, what we will see is in the first two parts of capital that we've set up some very detailed uh, understandings of these concepts such as uh, the commodity with its use value, exchange value and value. Uh, we've seen how uh, this uh, value is a social relation uh, which is uh, immaterial but objective and it needs an objective representation and its objective representation is in the money form and at a certain point, the circulation process moves from simply exchange of commodities to a money, commodity, money circulation, which means that there must be more money at the end of that circulation process than at the beginning. And that is the conversion of money into capital. And so what we see at the outset uh, is that uh, we get to the concept of money capital which is money being used as capital. And it is used to buy commodities, uh, the means of production and the labor power. And those are the th elements that we have discussed and we've discussed the institutional framework in which this is happening, which is perfectly functioning markets and private property rights and freedom of the market and all the rest of it. And we're now gonna go into the question of surplus value production which is we're going to take this red box, if you like. And for the next few chapters of Capital, in fact, right the way through, we're really going to be concentrating on what happens here and what its ramifications are. In the MCM process, we're going to go money, commodity, through to commodity, to realization of value in money form with all of the wants, needs and desires. And we discussed those very briefly in the chapter on capital. The commodities are in love with money, but the course of true love never did run smooth. So there could be a problem up here. The question of creation of wants, needs and desires, uh, the way in which uh, uh, commodity of labor power is reproduced. A uh, little bit about the reproduction of labor power, but not much and by no means uh, enough to really satisfy most people. But then there are the questions of the, the utilization of labor skills, uh, which are free gifts, if you like, that come from the cultural history uh, of work. And there is also uh, at several points a recognition of the metabolic relation to nature, which is uh, down here and the free gifts of nature which are involved and that metabolic relation to nature uh, is something which is referred to instant instantly so what we're doing right now is we're beginning to look more closely at this process throughout the rest of volume one we're going to assume that there's no problem of realization of value everything that goes on is okay it's all fine as far as Marx is concerned in volume one. Of course, it's not in reality in volume two, this will become problematic and volume three distribution will become problematic. But right now we're simply looking at the capitalist. We're not looking at uh, uh, in merchants and we're not looking at landlords and we're not looking at financiers. We're just looking at the, 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 the capitalist, the person who takes money capital and engages in this, in this process. And the big conundrum you have to come up with is that if there are exchanges and metamorphoses going on here from commodity form to money form, back to commodity form and back to money form, if that is going on, then how in a world where exchange is supposed to be uh, egalitarian uh, and, and equal equality, characterized by equality, how do you get an inequality of the, the creation of surplus value uh, out of this process? And the answer was uh, there is a commodity called labor power that has the capacity when incorporated into production to produce more value than it itself has. So 
I want you always to remember where you are in this kind of general approach to the circulation and accumulation of capital because we're now going to go into this whole, whole kind of question here, leaving behind uh, the noisy wor and, and, and obvious world of market exchange which goes uh, on uh, beneath it. So this is, if you like, the context uh, in which uh, we are working. And uh, in part three on the labor process and the valorization process, Marx takes up the question of uh, exactly how labor is used in production uh, to create surplus value. But he then does something very interesting, which is uh, a bit uh, unusual in capital. Because as I've often sort of noted, the categories that Marx uses are always those embedded within a capitalist mode of production. He's not talking about universals, but here he, he switches. Uh, so in the first uh, seven or eight pages of this chapter on the labor process, what Marx does is to talk about the universal condition which is involved in uh, labor processes in the sense that all modes of production uh, have labor processes and that there is uh, therefore a question of the metabolic relation to nature. And he said back on page 135 that the metabolic relation to nature is a universal condition of human existence independent of any particular uh, form. And he's going to repeat that here and therefore give a universal account of uh, the labor process. Uh, the first two pages of this uh, chapter are for me of critical importance. And I think that you need to think about them. Uh, as often happens with Marx, he, he doesn't explicate very much. But when you think about what he's saying, what he's saying ha has uh, huge implications for how we understand the world. Uh, and let us go through this then, uh, step by step. He starts off by saying, by saying that labor is, first of all, a process between man and nature, a process by which man, through his own actions, mediates, regulates, and controls the meta metabolism between himself and nature. So the idea of the metabolic relation becomes crucial. And that metabolic relation then needs to be explicated. He confronts the materials of nature as a force of nature. In that sentence, you get the sense that Marx is talking about human activity within nature rather than as outside of or opposed to nature. But then he goes on, he sets in motion the natural forces which belong to his own body. His arms, legs, head and hands in order to appropriate the materials of nature in a form adapted to his own needs. Through this, this movement, he acts upon external nature and changes it. And in this way, he simultaneously changes his own nature. This dialectical formulation, I think, is one which needs to be thought about. If we can only change ourselves by changing the world around us, then any project to change ourselves is also a project to change nature. Any project to change nature is also a social project. This would lead me to the conclusion that any ecological project is a social project and all social projects are, and political projects are ecological projects. And it is that dialectical relation which lies at the center of all human activity and Marx then goes on to say, he develops the potentialities slumbering within nature and subjects the play of its forces to his own sovereign power. Now, this point about changing the world and changing ourselves, uh, I think of it in, in these sorts of ways. 
that historically capitalism has been forced to create new structures of wants, needs and desires. It's been forced to actually change human nature in very fundamental and foundational ways. But it cannot do that transformation without changing uh, the natural world. So that the relation to nature uh, is also in constant transformation and we'll come back to this uh, in, in, later, in later parts of capital. The sort of example I would use for this is to say, well, after World War II, capital had a problem, which was lack of consumer consumption demand, uh, and it solved it through suburbanization. But suburbanization was a political economic project which also had vast environmental consequences. And in transforming the, 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 world, the world in which people lived, it also changed the notion of, who it, of what it meant to be a suburban dweller. Uh, suburbanites are notoriously uh, pro-capitalist. It's hard to imagine a revolutionary force coming out of the suburbs somehow. And this is the point that actually the creation of a human nature. But not everybody liked that human nature. For instance, first wave feminism was horrified by the way of life to which most women were condemned in, in, in the 1960s. So. Uh, I think it was Steinem who kind of said, uh, you know, the place with no name is our hugest em enemy, which was the suburban lifestyle. So, and now we've confronted, of course, with the environmental consequences of that transformation. So, it, from, from this standpoint, when we kind of say that in changing the world, we change ourselves, and in changing ourselves, we change the world, that that dialectic becomes, I think, rather central to the way in which we think about potentialities for change. I'm often on record of saying about, you know, all of this stuff about what kind of future cities can we build, that the real issue there is not that what kind of cities we want for the future, but what kind of people we want to be. And that therefore the kind of discussion of the creation of new urban environments uh, is it should be also about what kind of people are we trying to construct. Go and look at Hudson Yards and ask yourself the question, what kind of persona is going to come out of that project to create that kind of living environment in New York City? That was an interesting kind, kind of political, economic and ecological question. So this argument that Marx is making, that, th that through the movement he acts upon external nature and changes it, and in this way he simultaneously changes his own nature. That dialectic seems to me is something we really should be thinking about a lot, particularly in contemporary conditions. Then Marx goes on to say that We're not dealing here with instinctive forms of labor. An immense interval of time, he says, separates the state of things in which a man brings his labor power to market for sale as a commodity from the situation when human labor had not yet cast off its first instinctive form. We presuppose, he says, labor in a form in which it is an exclusively human characteristic. A spider conducts operations which resemble those of the weaver, and a bee would put many a human architect to shame by the construction of its honeycomb cells. But what distinguishes the worst architect from the best of bees is that the architect builds the cell in his mind before he constructs it in wax. At the end of every labor process, a result emerges which has already been conceived by the worker at the beginning, hence already existed ideally. Now this too is a somewhat strange statement given 
the general way in which we might look upon Marx's thinking. Because Marx is anti-idealist. But what he said here is that there is an idealist moment which is absolutely critical within the labor process, that there is an imaginary involved. And that imaginary and an intentionality, all of that has to be taken into account in terms of what the labor process is about. Which is not to say that the whole world is shaped by ideas. Where do the ideas come from? Well, if you take the first thing we were talking about, the ideas of what to do in the world have come out of a particular transformation of the world, the suburbanization and suburban lifestyle and all, all the rest of it. So again, we're dealing with a dialectical thing in which there is an idealist moment within a materialist process. And that idealist moment always has an opening for something different to happen. The analogy here would be that in the, the, the discussion of money, if you recall, he said one of the functions of money is that people can treat money as an idealist representation of value. The person who's made a commodity takes it to market and imagines what its value is and hangs a price on what they take to market. They may not make that price, they may, may, they may get more, they may get less, but the initial moment is an idealist gesture. It's an idealist gesture in which the imagination of the entrepreneurs is to say, okay, this is, this is what uh, the commodity is worth, or what I think it is worth. So within Marx's analysis, the role of ideas and ideals or idealistic, you know, idealist, uh, moments, the roles of that are embedded in an overall materialist world. But embedded within does not mean that they're completely subsumed within. There are always then these possibilities for something different to occur. Uh, so here is Marx kind of saying, well, uh, within the labor process, uh, we always start with an idea of what it is we want to produce, how we want to produce it, where we want to produce it, and what we want to do with it. And the idea may fail, or it may succeed. The material circumstances will decide that. But there is this idealist moment. And Marx actually at other points will say that, you know, ideas are a material force in historical transformation. So it is not true to say that Marx has no room whatsoever for ideas or, you know. No, he does have some room. It's not huge room, but it's still a certain room uh, for idealist constructions. As he goes on to say, man not only affects a change of form in the materials of nature, he also realizes his own purpose in those materials. That is, there's intentionality, intentionality here. And this is a purpose, uh, his own purpose. In these, uh, and, and this is, is a purpose he is conscious of. It determines the mode of his activity with the rigidity of a law and he must subordinate his will to it. This subordination is no mere momentary act, apart from the exertion of the working organs, and he then goes on to sort of say that this, the work that's involved here means close attention, discipline, and the less he is attracted by the nature of the work and the way in which it has to be accomplished, and the less, therefore, he enjoys it, as the free play of his own physical and mental powers, the closer his attention is forced to be. Now, what Marx is doing here, I think, is actually engaging in a discussion with Fourier. Uh, Fourier was one of those uh, kind of uh, utopian thinkers. And one of the great things about Fourier is he actually thought that work could be reduced to play and that all work should become play. Uh, 
and it should be pleasure at play and not... Marx is kind of disputing that. He's disputing the sort of Fourierist view of, uh, of what the labour process might be about. Uh, and Marx is actually... You know, maybe some people would say this is the Germanic side of, uh, uh, of Marx coming out, which is kind of rather sort of, you know, well, you've got to be hard working at it. But I think that this is an important as a way to think about labor processes. Um, I think I would say this, that in my own experience of, uh, of, of writing a book, it goes something like this. You have a brilliant idea. You think it's going to be great. You kind of get very excited about it and you just kind of can't wait to get to the typewriter and start working at it. Uh, about six months later, you're kind of groaning a bit, kind of going, and then there comes a point where the project runs you. You no longer run the project. It seems like it gets a life of its own, and you kind of find yourself. And, you know, six months after that, you can't wait to get out of the prison that you've created for yourself. Uh, I'm, uh, what, what, what Marx is saying is that any labor process is always going to be a bit like that. And that if you think it's going to be all fun and games all the way through, then you're going to be severely disillusioned and, and, and actually certain projects in order to bring them to completion, uh, you need uh, to uh, recognize that it's going to take discipline and it's going to take uh, close attention and, and uh, that's the only way in which you're going to uh, actually... So he's, he's disputing this thing that as soon as it stops being fun and, 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 and play, you just abandon it and go off and do something else, which is the sort of Fourierist view. Uh, he's taking, well, projects uh, have a logic of their own and it takes a lot of discipline to complete them. So this then, then leads Marx to sort of discuss the general characteristics, the simple elements of the labor process, purposeful activity, that is work itself, the object on which that work is performed, and the instruments of that work. And he goes and talks a little about the, the, the objects, and he talks a little bit about the instruments and the instruments of labor, uh, how nature becomes one of the organs of his activity, which he annexes to his own bodily organs, ag adding stature to himself in spite of the Bible. As the earth is his original larder, so too it is his original tool house. And he then talks about tool, human beings as being tool-making animals and, and uh, how instruments of labor are designed and used actually tends, tends to dis, uh, distinguish different economic epochs. Uh, and he talks in, in the, uh, about uh, the conditions of labor, that it's not only and, uh, and, uh, infrastructures and other things that are needed, uh, so there is this general universal discussion uh, of uh, the, the labor processes, making a number of, of, of particular points. For instance, on 288, he talks about uh, uh, the fact that many objects have uh, require multiple inputs but also there are multiple outputs. Uh, and this is a sort of a economic problem that you know, many labor processes produce uh, different uh, commodities uh, jointly. So there's a problem of joint products. For instance, if you raise sheep, uh, you can use them for wool, you can use them for milk, or you can use them for meat. So that whenever you raise, you know, so which commodity is the important commodity and what happens when there are actually three commodities involved in the case of that, but many, uh, many chemical processes produ produce byproducts uh, which, which are, are in themselves uh, valuable. Um, so the labor process then uh, has to be looked at in this universal way. Uh, but uh, then there comes, I think, uh, uh, some important uh, I information on the bottom of 289 where Marx talks about uh, the way in which machines might be used in a labor process. Machines are not 
used to make commodities in such a way that parts of the machine end up in the commodity. The machine is always there, so how do we start to actually look at the use of tools and machines and the like? Uh, and at the bottom of 289 he kind of says this, a machine which is not active in the labor process is useless. In addition, it falls prey to the destructive power of natural processes, iron rusts, wood rots. Yarn which we in which we neither weave nor knit is cotton wasted. Living labor must seize on these things, awaken them from the dead, change them from merely possible into real and effective use values. Bathed in the fire of labor, appropriated as part of its organism, and infused with vital energy for the performance of the functions appropriate to their concept and to their vocation in the process. They are indeed consumed, but to some purpose, as elements in the formation of new use values, new products, which are capable of entering into individual consumption as means of subsistence, or into a new labor process as means of production. Now the point about this is that Marx's language is frequently talking uh, in this term, bathed in the fire of labor. That labor is the animating force. Labor is what revives use values. Labor is what revives value. And so the labor process becomes uh, critical for taking dead, inanimate aspects of the world around us and transforming it into something uh, which is processual, open, and at the same time <coughs> uh, useful and, and rewarding. That the labor process uh, has to be kept in motion, and this goes back to what this diagram is about. The continuity of this process, cannot, you cannot afford to let it, anything lapse. If things fall to one side, they're no longer part of this process. If machines are no longer used, they are not part of this process. But they can be reanimated by the living power of labor. So part of what Marx is doing here is to come up with a re rhetoric of a certain kind, which ta is talking about living labor as the the feature uh, which is going to animate and reanimate uh, this world which is being constructed through the flows of, of, of capital. <clears throat> he makes then a very interesting kind of point which is actually incorporated into this uh, diagram here. Labor uses up its material elements, he says on 290 its objects and its instruments. It consumes them and is therefore a process of consumption. Such productive consumption is distinguished from individual consumption. This distinction in Marx that says there are two forms of consumption. Individual consumption, which is what you and I engage in, and productive consumption, which is what the capitalist does when the capitalist consumes energy Capitalist consumes raw materials. So a lot of consumption in society is done by capital consuming products as it creates commodities which end up in final consumption. Productive consumption is a very important aspect of the market. Uh, for example, uh, when China had to face up to the crisis of 2008 with loss of jobs. It, it needed to find a market which had, was lost, as it were, because of the collapse of the US consumer market. Where was that market going to be? Well, many people actually started to say, well, maybe you should get your own middle class to consume more. Well, you know, that wasn't... But the way they did it was to build infrastructures. That is, they ratcheted up productive consumption, not final consumption. And ratcheting up productive consumption, of course, 
increases the demand for products, but it does it uh, in a very, very particular kind of way. But this distinction between productive consumption and final consumption is an important one in throughout Marx's analysis, because productive consumption is always about reinvestment and about new investment, and how important new investment is in creating the market as opposed to people consuming goods in final consumption. So he then summarizes this, uh, his argument at the bottom of 290 in the following way. The Loeber pro process, as we've just presented it in its simple and abstract elements, is purposeful activity, going back to this notion of intentionality and purposefulness, is purposeful activity aimed at the production of use values. It is an appropriation of what exists in nature for the requirements of man. It is the universal condition for the metabolic interaction between man and nature, the everlasting nature-imposed condition of human existence. And it is therefore independent of every form of that existence. That is, it's not just about capitalist mode of production, it's about everything. Or rather, it is common to all forms of society in which human beings live. We, there, we did not, therefore, have to present the worker in his relationship with other workers. It was enough to present man and his labor on one side, nature and its materials on the other. The taste of porridge does not tell us who grew the oats. And the process we have presented does not reveal the conditions under which it takes place. Whether it is happening under the slave owner's brutal lash or the anxious eye of the capitalist, whether Cincinnatus undertakes it in tilling his couple of acres or a savage when he lays low a wild beast with a stone. So this, these passages then are the universality of the metabolic relation to nature where Marx is proposing some things which are unavoidable for all modes of production including the capitalist mode of production. So that the capitalist mode of production can never escape these metabolic constraints. But Marx is pointing to them as, I think, significant to his analysis. But then, as he often does, he then says this. Let us now return to our would-be capitalist. That is, okay, we're going to forget the universality of all of this, and we're going to talk about the particular ways in which this labor process, which has universal qualities, is, is developed within a capitalist mode of production. Um, and Marx goes on to say, we left him just after he had purchased in the open market all the necessary factors of the labor process, its objective factors, the means of production, as well as its personal factor, labor power. With the key eye of an expert, he has selected the means of production and the kinds of labor power best adapted to his particular trade. He then proceeds to consume the commodity, the labor power he has just bought, i.e. he causes the worker, the bearer of that labor power, to consume the means of production by his labor. That is, he brings the commodities, labor power, and means of production into the red box, which is about production of commodities and, of course, production of value and surplus value. And he then goes on to say, he must begin, the capitalist must begin, by taking the labor power as he finds it in the market. And consequently, he must be satisfied with the kind of labor which arose in a period when there was, were as yet no capitalists. That is, the labor power that is available is something that is historically inherited. And then he says, the transformation of the mode of production itself, which results in the subordination of labor to capital, can only occur later on, and we shall therefore deal with it in a later chapter. His argument is going to be just to give you a sense of what's coming, is that capital starts off by taking labor as it finds it, taking its skills and utilizing those skills up to the hilt. But at a certain point, capital has to f discover and develop its own technological configuration, which is going to come, of course, with the creation of factory production and machine-led produ factory production which is going to be, if you like, the specific uh, 
form of production which is unique to the capitalist mode of production. But that is not a starting point. It's not as if capital can go off and say, OK, I, here I come with a factory and I'm going to set up the factory. No, the factory emerges out of a, a, a preceding period where capital colonizes pre-existing conditions of labor skills and labor, technolo and, and labor technologies. But later we're going to see how eventually capital transforms uh, the technological mixes and the organizational forms of capital. So what does this mean then? The labor process, he says, when it is the process by which the capitalist consumes labor power, exhibits two characteristic phenomena. First, the worker works under the control of the capitalist to whom his labor belongs. When the capitalist goes, in, when the worker goes into the into the workplace, then the labor power of the worker is at the disposal of the capitalist. The capitalist basically says, "I own your labor power, and therefore you do what I tell you. You are under my control." Secondly. The product is the property of the capitalist and not that of the worker, its immediate producer. Now this is Marx's theory of alienation, if you like. That the worker, through the wage contract, gives up any control over the labor process. So the capitalist controls the labor process and the capitalist controls the work of the laborer. Furthermore, the laborer who produces the commodity doesn't have anything to say about the commodity. And there's going to be a third condition, which is that the value belongs entirely to the capitalist, not to the worker. So he's put two conditions here. The third one is coming a bit later. As he says on 292, from the instant he steps into the workshop, the use value of his labor power, and therefore also its use, which is labor, belongs to the capitalist. By the purchase of labor power, the capitalist incorporates labor as a living agent of fermentation. You know, fire, you know, stuff. The living agent of fermentation into the lifeless constituents of the product, which also belong to him. From his point of view, the labor process is nothing more than the consumption of the commodity purchased, i.e. of labor power. But he can consume this labor power only by adding the means of production to it. The labor process is a process between things the capitalist has purchased, things which belong to him. Thus the product of this process belongs to him just as much as the wine, which is the product of the process of fermentation going on in his cellar. So, as soon as you get inside the red box in this diagram, the laborer has given up all control over the labor process. That is going to be designed by the capitalist and has lost control entirely of the commodity which is going to be produced. But what is the capitalist interested in? The capitalist is, of course, interested in the exchange value. Our capitalist, he says on 293, has two objectives. In the first place, he wants to produce a use value, which has exchange value, i.e. an article destined to be sold, a commodity. And secondly, he wants to produce a commodity greater in value than the sum of the values of the commodities used to produce it, namely the means of production and the labor power he purchased with his good money in the open market. His aim is to produce not only a use value, but a commodity. Not only use value, but value. And not just value, but also surplus value. So the capitalist has to organize what goes on in the red box, in the labor process. Organize it in such a way that it not only produces a use value, but it produces value and it produces surplus value. So how is this done? So he then goes on to say, all right, let's look at this process of creating value. 
Uh, Marx here, from here on, plays uh, some games, and you have to get used to him doing this. He kind of says, well, how does it look from the standpoint of the capitalist? And he tells these little stories and how the capitalist might think of it this way and, and thinks, thinks of it that way and then stares in astonishment when he sees, oh my God, surplus value has come out magically. How did that happen? It's kind of a naive account of, uh, of uh, what is going on in the labor process. And what this does is to sort of set up what appear to be some conundrums about exactly how this surplus value is produced. And in order to do this, he's going to take the labor process and partition it into various parts. So that on 296 he'll say this, during the labor process, the worker's labor constantly undergoes a transformation from the form of unrest into that of being, from the form of motion into that of objectivity. That is, a process results in an object. A potter is engaged in a process and the end is a pot. So it's a thing. So a process produces a thing. At the end of one hour, the spinning, he says, and he uses the case of spinning, notion is represented by a certain quantity of yarn. In other words, a definite quantity of labor, namely that of one hour, has been objectified in the cotton. We say labor, i.e. the expenditure of his vital force by the spinner, and not spinning labor, because the special work of spinning counts here only insofar as it is the of expenditure of labor power in general, and not the specific labor of the spinner. And then this gets into the question of the temporality, how much time is spent on the spinning or the making of the pot and how much of that socially necessary labor time is then represented by the final product. And he says on 297, definite quantities of product, quantities which are determined by experience, now represent nothing but definite quantities of labor definite masses of crystallized labor time, they are now simply the material shape taken by a given number of hours or days of social labor. And again, it's social labor, not concrete labor. And the bottom of 297, having gone through this process, our capitalist, he says, stares in astonishment. The value of the product is equal to the value of the capital advanced. The value advanced has not been valorized. No surplus value has been created. And consequently, money has not been transformed into capital. And then he talks about how a capitalist deals with this. Uh, one of the things the capitalist says is, well, I deserve something because I've worked hard. Uh, was a theory of abstinence. And he goes through the theory of abstinence. Uh, have I not rendered society an incalculable service by providing my instruments of production, my cotton and my spindle? In other words, he wants to legitimize and justify taking more than the value as his own particular reward. Uh, and the various arguments the capitalist seems to go through about, you know, he says on page 300, the capitalist says, have I myself not worked? Have I not performed the labor of superintendence of overseeing the spinner? And does not this labor, my labor, too create value? The capitalist own overseer and manager shrug their shoulders. In the meantime, with a hearty laugh, he recovers his composure. The whole litany he has just recited was simply meant to pull the wool over our eyes. He himself does not care twopence for it, twopence for it. He leaves this and all similar subterfuges and conjuring tricks to the professors of political economy who are paid for it. He himself is a practical man, and although he does not always consider what he says outside his business, within his business he knows what he is doing. Let us examine the matter more closely. And then he talks about the value of a day's labor amounts to three shillings, the past labor uh, incorporates a certain amount of value, uh, the fact that half a day's labor is necessary to keep the worker alive during 24 hours does not in any way prevent him from working a whole day. Therefore, the value of labor power, 
and the value which that labor power valorizes in the labor process are two entirely different magnitudes. And this difference was what the capitalist had in mind when he was purchasing the labor power. The useful quality of labor power, and I think it's interesting to say, okay, what's the use value of labor power to the capitalist? The use value of labor power to the capitalist is it produces surplus value. That's what the use value is. And this, and as he says, what was really decisive for him, for the capitalist, was the specific use value which this commodity, labor power, possesses of being a source not only of value, but of more value than it has itself. This is on page 301. This is the specific service the capitalist expects from labor power. And in this transaction, he acts in accordance with the eternal laws of commodity exchange. There's no infringement of the laws of commodity exchange. Terribly important, this, to Marx. That you can have perfectly functioning markets with, with absolute kind of reciprocity and equality of exchange. Not offend any of that through monopoly power or anything else. You don't have to offend any of that because the surplus value is going to not be produced in the market. It's going to be produced in the production process by mobilizing the labor power in such a way that it produces more value than it itself has. And this is the, what he's saying on page 301. Our capitalists foresaw this situation. Every condition of the problem is satisfied, he says. Well, what problem? Um, the problem was the contradiction in the circulation of capital. While all the laws of governing the exchange of commodities have not been violated in any way, equivalent has been exchanged for equivalent. For the capitalist as buyer paid the full value of each commodity, for the cotton, for the spindle, and for the labor power. He then did what is done by every purchase of commodities. He consumed their use value. Yet for all this, this whole course of events, the transformation of money into capital both, both takes place and does not take place in the sphere of circulation. That is, when you look at this total circulation process, which we have up here, there is a moment in this circulation process, which is that moment of valorization, production of value and of surplus value. But it is embedded in an overall circulation process. It is not outside of the circulation process. So the, the dilemma for Marx was how to keep the rules of perfect exchange operative for this whole circulation process at the same time as he created surplus value. And the answer lies, it is in the utilization of labor power as a commodity that has the use value, that it can produce more value than it itself has. And that's a very simple thing. Now this appears a kind of almost like a magical kind of process from the outside. And Marx comments on this, on 302, 303. By turning his money into commodities, which serve as the building materials for a new product and as factors in the labor process, by incorporating living labor into their lifeless objectivity, the capitalist simultaneously transforms value, i.e. past labor, in its objectified and lifeless form into capital, value which can perform its own valorization process, an animated monster which begins to work as if its body were by love possessed. Getting also here to the point where this whole system is going to be driven onwards by that pursuit of love possessed. That is, the pursuit of surplus value. If we now compare the process of creating value with the process of valorization, we see that the latter is nothing but the continuation of the former beyond a definite point. If the process is not carried beyond the point where the value paid by the capitalist for the labor power is re replaced by an exact equivalent, it is simply a process of creating value. 
But if, if it is continued beyond that point, it becomes a process of valorization. So he distinguishes here between creation of value and a process of valorization, which is the creation of surplus value. If we proceed further and compare the process of creating value with the labor process, we find that the latter consists in the useful labor which produces use value. Here the movement of production is viewed qualitatively with regard to the particular kind of article produced and in accordance with the purpose and content of the movement. But if it is viewed as a value creating process, the same labor process appears only quantitatively. Now what Marx is doing here is going back to that distinction between concrete and abstract labor. Because what happens in the labor process is the laborer is doing two things. They're producing a concrete use value at the same time as they're creating value and surplus value. And Marx goes on to say, here it is a question merely of the time needed to do the work of the period, that is, during which the labor power is usefully expended. Time spent in production counts only insofar as it is socially necessary for the production of a use value. This has various consequences. First, the labor power must be functioning under normal conditions. And we're going to have a discussion here which is about the conditions of labor and the normal conditions of laboring. And he says on 303, a further condition is that the labor power itself must be of normal effectiveness. In the trade in which it is employed, it must possess the average skill, dexterity and speed prevalent in that trade. And our capitalists took good care to buy labor power of such normal qualities. It must be expended with the average amount of exertion and usual degree of intensity. Intensity is an interesting concept in Marx. The intensity of the labor process is something which is often a matter of commentary. And the capitalist is as careful to see that this is done, so he is to ensure that his workmen are not idle for a single moment. He has bought the use of the labor power for a definite period, and he insists on his rights. And this question of rights is going to come up. He has no intention of being robbed. Lastly, for this purpose, our friend has a penal code of his own. All wasteful consumption of raw material or instruments of labor is strictly forbidden because what is wasted in this way represents a superfluous expenditure of quantities of objectified labor, labor that does not count in the product or enter into its value. So here he's saying the labor process, the, the, the capitalist has to oversee the labor process and make sure that it is all socially necessary. And he has to make sure that it functions under normal conditions, has to make sure that it's a requisite skill, of normal effectiveness and normal intensity and all those kinds of things. And he is on it, in his right to insist on all of this because he has bought the labor power. And as an owner of that labor power, not of the laborer, he is entitled to say, you have to do this in this kind of way, even though you have these skills. Um, there's then a footnote, which you may care to look at, which is uh, about how capitalism, as opposed to slavery, has to be much more concerned with the intensity of the work and the labor process, the skill that's involved in the work, uh, and ensure that there is no waste. And Marx takes the view that slave labor, this is not necessarily true, by the way, historically there's a lot of dispute over this, slave labor is far less efficient than wage labor. Because wage labor put under the control of the capitalist is going to be forced to give up its use value to the capitalist under conditions in which the capitalist controls the labor process. And there, this is going to be very different from conditions of slave labor. And there's some interesting kind of questions, again, about skilled labor and so on, in a footnote on page 305, which you may want to spend some time on. 
because it goes back to the question of skilled labor. So this is the, 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 the point that we've, we've come to, that the capitalist, uh, if we want to revitalize Marx's notion of alienation, you would say the, the worker is alienated in a variety of senses, that they give up control over the labor process, they give up any control over the product, over their product. But they also surrender a great deal in the way of control because the capitalist is going to in insist uh, upon intensity, upon the intensity, the appropriation of skills and, 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 and all the rest of it. And that the, capital, the, the worker is going to give up also surplus value. And so if you wanted to talk about alienated labor, it is because the, the worker has no control over the labor process, no control over the product, no control over the surplus value. And the labor process is going to be organized in this super efficient, w intensive way, because that is where the surplus value comes from, because you want there to be this difference uh, between what you have to pay labor to engage in the labor process and what that laborer produce, produces under the rule of capital. Now this is the point here, that what the capitalist has to do is to actually appropriate that labor and organize it in such a way as to produce surplus value. So surplus value does not arise naturally. It arises because that's what the capital is looking for, that's what capital is going to organize and that's how the system of labor, the labor process is going to be organized. Now ch chapter 8 is uh, on about the relationship of constant capital and variable capital. I don't want to spend too much uh, time on this. Constant capital is simply all, is the value of all of those means of production which are brought into the labor pr process to be used in production. So it's the raw materials, the energy, uh, the machinery, and all the rest of it. So constant capital are all those elements of capital which are brought together, which are going to be used by the laborer. Marx calls it constant capital because the way he argues it is that the value of that capital does not change. The value of that capital is given by the socially necessary labor time which is involved in production of those means of production. So the value has already been incorporated by labor. Uh, and that labor is then simply transferred into the final product through the act of production. So no new capital is being created. Now this is, has some very interesting implications. One of them is that machines cannot create value. Machines simply facilitate the creation of value by labor, but they do not in themselves produce value. Now most people like to think machines produce value. And, and that therefore, but no, Marx is kind of saying constant capital does not produce value and it's constant because it is past dead labor and that past dead labor has to be animated by li living labor in order for the value which is incorporated in those commodities as inputs can be transferred to the final commodity which will then be sold. So that value is simply transferred and labor does two operations. It not only creates value and surplus value, it also preserves past value. Because past value, if it has no uses, is dead labor, is lost value. So what the laborer does is to revitalize that labor by taking the raw materials and the value involved in the intermediate products and then converting them and putting them into this new product. So constant capital then is put that way. 
Variable capital is that part of the inputs which can produce more value and can be therefore a source of value and surplus value. But variable capital is not variable in the following sense. Variable capital is that capital which is required to purchase labor power at a given standard of living. And we've gone through the question of what fixes the value of labor power. The value of labor power depends on the value of the commodities needed to reproduce the labor at a given standard of living. So it is constant. But the value of that labor power can be recuperated from a production process after, say, five or six hours of labor. After five or six hours of labor, if you work the laborer longer, then there's a surplus. That's where the surplus value comes. That you work the laborer and generate value to the point where you cover the cost of the value of labor power. You then work them further and that's your surplus value. And it's variable because labor power as a commodity has the capacity to produce value. And it reproduces its own value in, say, six hours. And if it works for 12 hours, there's six hours beyond that which is producing value for somebody else, which is, of course, the capitalist. So these are the two categories which are very important to Marx, which are constant capital and variable capital. There's a big distinction between Marx and the classical political economists. The distinction that really was most... Uh, concerning to classical political economy was the distinction between circulating capital and fixed capital. Now that has a role to play, role to play, and Marx deals with it much later, particularly in volume two. But here he's kind of saying the foundation of surplus value can only be understood by defining these categories of constant capital and variable capital. Constant capital is the value of all of the goods. Now, there is also a problem with constant capital. That is that a large part of the constant capital actually takes fixed form. And there's a big difference for the capitalist between the capital advanced in a production process and the capital used up. Put it this way. When a capitalist wants to set up production, they have to build a factory. They have to advance the capital to build the factory. But the factory is going to last 20 years. And it's not going to be all used up in one year. And the factory is going to produce goods. So there's a difference between the, cap the constant capital advanced and the constant capital used up in the production process. Raw materials are used up. Energy is used up directly. Many other means of production are used up directly. But the fixed capital of the machines and the factory itself are not used up directly. They're only used up over 20 years, say. In which case, only part of the value of the constant capital passes into the final product. Marx uses the argument that, well, if, if the factory or the, and, 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 and the, uh, the machinery last for 20 years, then one twentieth of the value will pass into the value of the product every year. So after 20 years, he will have completely covered the, the capital advanced. But this distinction between capital advanced and capital used up creates some complications which will be later looked at. But at this point in the analysis, Marx is saying, well, we have to look at this and the relationships in such a way that to recognize that the value transferred, constant capital, is, is not going to figure in the amount of surplus value which is generated. And so in, in the chapter on constant and variable capital, 
uh, you have to deal with some of these uh, complications which Marx is alert to and, and doesn't completely resolve and basically puts them aside uh, for, for later analysis. So let's turn then towards the end of this chapter. The finished commodity can be conceptualized as having a value of constant capital which, is be, which has been transferred to the product, which is not the same as the total capital advanced. The constant capital plus the variable capital, which is the value of labor power, plus whatever can be produced in the way of surplus value. This gives Marx a simple formula. That the value of a commodity in the market is going to be set in terms of C plus V plus S. And this is, if you like, uh, the general kind of discussion uh, which he is uh, laying out in this chapter on constant and variable capital. I, it says uh, on the bottom of 317, towards the end, I therefore call it the variable part of capital, or more briefly, variable capital, that is, the labor power. The same elements of capital which, from the point of view of the labor process, can be distinguished respectively as the objective and subjective factors, as means of production and labor power, can be distinguished from the point of view of the valorization process as constant and variable capital. The definition of constant capital given above by no means excludes the possibility of a change of value of its elements. That is, uh, over time, raw material values may change and all the rest of it. Suppose that the price of cotton is one day sixpence a pound and the next day, as a result of failure of the cotton crop, a shilling a pound. And then he goes on to say, and we find, he says, there may be speculation on... on, 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 on the, the market as well. Um, and then comes the question of the depreciation of machinery. Uh, what happens uh, as you take that portion of the machine, one-tenth of the value of the machine, of the lifetime of the machine is ten years, into the product. So that the, But we also see that the ratio of C to V is very dependent upon the technology. That high, highly skilled labor or machine technology can actually get the laborer to process more constant capital. So the ratio of C to V is an important variable which is dependent very much on the technology that capital-intensive versus labor-intensive production. If you take the ratio of C uh, over V, you get uh, a measure of capital intensity. And the more you develop new technologies, the more, more use values that the laborer can, can create uh, in a given period of time uh, means that the more value can be created uh, also uh, with the help of increasing technology. Uh, Marx kind of says at the end here, the technical conditions of the labor process may be revolutionized to such an extent that where formerly 10 men used 10 implements of small value worked up a relatively small quantity of raw material one man may now, with the aid of one expensive machine, work up 100 times as much raw material. In the latter case, we have an enormous increase in the constant capital, i.e. the total value of the means of production employed, and at the same time, a great reduction in the variable part of the capital, which has been laid out in labor power. This change, however, alters only the quantitative relation between the constant and the variable capital, or the proportion in which the total capital is split up into its constant and variable constituents. Uh, 
it has not in the least degree affected the essential difference between the two. Later on in Capital, this question of the relationship between C and V is going to become very important. Uh, and I, can s I think you can see immediately why that might be the case. Because if labor is the source of all value and surplus value, and if more and more technological change is coming in, you're employing less and less labor. And if there's less and less labor, then that means there's less and less value. So there's a kind of real kind of question is the role of what's the role of technological change? And why would capitalists gauge in technological change, which is labor saving, when labor is the source of value and surplus value? So that question is already, if you like, lurking beneath the surface of the analysis here. Chapter 9 is about the rate of surplus value. Again, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I just want to say um, that Marx does a very clever thing here. That is, he kind of says, if you want to think about uh, the relationship between capital and labor, you would start to look at the ratio of surplus value to variable capital. In other words, the S over V ratio, surplus value to variable capital, which depends very much on the length of the working day, as we see, and also will depend on how much labor, how quickly labor can cover its costs of, social, of reproduction. But if labor can co cover its cost of reproduction in three hours and it works for 10 hours, then there's seven hours of surplus value, which means that the ratio of S over V is the rate of surplus value. But Marx understands that if he goes to working people and says to them, uh, you know, you're existing under a condition of uh, uh, you know, a high rate of surplus value, uh, working people would kind of look and say, what the hell are you talking about? So he shifts the language here and introduces the notion that the rate of surplus value is a measure of the rate of exploitation. Which is a very smart move. But I, I'm told, and I'm not sure this is the case, I'm told that actually uh, during these years exploitation was not, at the cent was not central even in working class discourses of the time. But what Marx did in Capital was to focus on the question of exploitation and turn exploitation into a crucial kind of question. And the rate of exploitation, which is a meaning, became a very meaning political term with a lot of connotations, very different from the rate of surplus value. So he has two languages going here. One is the technical language, which is the rate of surplus value, which is defined as uh, S over V, that is the ratio of the sur surplus to variable capital. And then Marx kind of saying, this is actually the rate of exploitation. And you've got to pay attention to that. So he's trying to say to workers, do you realize what kind of rate of exploitation you have? And try to provide a tool whereby people can start to get some estimate of what their rate of exploitation is. And this is a... Uh, this entered into working class discourse, certainly after Marx's Capital was published and, and, and through the labor movement in general. And of course the rate of exploitation and the concept of exploitation of labor power and all the rest of it uh, has a long history in, in working uh, in, in working class uh, movements, but Marx shifts his language in this uh, uh, in this uh, chapter from a sort of technical language of rate of surplus value to rate of exploitation. The rate of surplus value then, or the rate of exploitation is where it is that Marx wants to be, and it's going to lead, of course, into uh, uh, the chapter on the working day. But meanwhile, uh, he also has a lot of fun with Senior's last hour. I don't know if you in 
enjoyed that little essay. Um, it, it, the, the argument goes, for, uh, goes a bit like this, that we can clearly look at a, a labor process involved in the production of commodity and say, okay, there's constant capital involved, there's variable capital involved, and there's surplus value involved. So we have the value of a commodity, which is C plus V plus S. And we can look at it and kind of say, all right, let's look at the temporality of this. Uh, and there is no temporality in the production of the value in constant value uh, of constant capital because that temporality is in the past. That's dead value in the past, which is going to be resuscitated by uh, the application of living labor to it, and then that value is going to be transferred. So there's no creation of value going on there, but we can say the amount of value of constant capital is uh, the value of past labor. Uh, and that value can be accounted for, that is, you can add up all the socially necessary labor time involved in the production of the machines, the production of the intermediate products, uh, and the production of the raw materials. You can add all that up and say that is the value of the constant capital, which is the value of the past labor, which has not yet been realized and is going to be realized through productive consumption, which is where the productive consumption then comes in. It's going to be realized in the productive consumption. But there is no need for the capital. The, the labor doesn't actually produce that value. It's already there. It just simply has to be transferred. It has to be reanimated by uh, the living fire of labor. Uh, so this, this so we, but we can say, uh, okay, the value of C is, say, uh, 10 pounds or whatever. And then we can say, what's the value of labor power? And we can say, well, uh, you know, the value of labor power in a given community, a given t certain time is, uh, say, uh, uh, f four pounds or whatever. So the C plus V is 10 plus four, which is 14. So we can say the value of the commodity is 14. But then there is the amount of surplus value which is created, uh, which we then add in and say there's another surplus value of four, so it's it's now 18. So the total value of the commodity is is, is 18, which is uh, the past value plus uh, the value of labor power plus the surplus value. So we can use that method of uh, of accounting. But then uh, what happened was that there was this legislation about trying to uh, limit the length of the working day. So what the capitalists then did was to take that accounting system, which Marx says is, is formally correct, and then say, however, that actually the worker has to work uh, the first uh, four hours or whatever it is, or ten hours to produce uh, the worker has to work uh, to order to reproduce the value of labor power, of, of the constant capital. So instead of saying the constant capital is worth uh, 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 10 pounds, uh, the, 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 the worker has to work to make the 10 pounds, which is already there in the constant capital. And then, of course, the, the, there is the, the value of the labor power. And then the argument was that the capitalist profit comes from the last hour of the day. And if you restrict the working day from 12 hours to 11 hours, you will take away all of the profit because all of the profit is earned in that last hour. And this was the argument that the capitalists started to make against the limitation of the length of the working day. That they said, in effect, that you know, we only cover our costs in the first 11 hours of the working day, and it's the 11th hour to the 12th hour which gives us all our profit. If you limit the length of the working day and bring it down to 11 hours, we'll have no profit. And Marx kind of is saying, this is a, this is a as he says of, of Senior, he says, and this is the professor who was summoned to Manchester uh, to learn the techniques that he then went to teach back in Oxford. Uh, and the professor calls this an analysis. Well, it's obvious that the worker does not have to work uh, to, pr to produce the value of the, the equivalent value of the, uh, of the constant capital because that value is already embodied in the, in, in the price of that constant capital. 
So it's already there. What the worker does is to, is to transfer that value, not, not, doesn't have to create it. So uh, the profit comes from the rate of exploitation, which is S over V, rather than uh, from some sort of uh, last uh, final hour. Furthermore, Marx is also going to say that, yeah, you can think of it, uh, we, when we think about the working day, we think of it one way, but, but uh, actually we have to think also about the working hour and the proportionalities in the working hour. So later on when he looks at piecework uh, and other wage forms, we see that uh, this, can, this can be arrived at. The, this, this theory of the relationship between C plus V plus S is a proportionate kind of theorization and it's not therefore simply limited to uh, the, 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 uh, the whole day. So the rate of surplus value then, or the rate of exploitation, is a, a, a very, very important configuration that Marx is laying out and, and attacking, and he's going to talk about uh, that very much in the chapter on the working day, which I won't have time to get into today. So uh, we'll let's stop here and sort of talk about some of the, any of the concepts that you have, uh, which are uh, in these chapters where you want uh, some f more explication. So let me stop here and get some, see if there's some questions or discussion. Hi. Um, as, I, as I read this chapter, I think about how much, um, how much I make, how much my friends make, how much my uh, partner makes. And it strikes me that we make vastly different amounts, and the reproduction of our labor seems unrelated to our wages um, in this kind of strict sense. Um, can you unpack that a little bit and explore that? Yeah, I think that uh, I've already suggested in the chapter on the uh, value of labor power and the buying and selling of labor power. Uh, that Marx uh, accepts that in practice there will be all sorts of deviations and uh, but for theoretical reasons he kind of says I you know I'm going to assume it is fixed and it's also fixed in a perfect uh, market situation where perfectly competitive conditions will will apply so we have these sort of economic assumptions if you were uh, and uh, in practice, as we know, there are all kinds of features that enter, enter into wage determination, all kinds of haphazard uh, aspects uh, of uh, the labor market, which Marx does not get into. Um, I mean, I think he should have spent more time getting into it for precisely the reasons you're asking, that if you want, if, if, if you want people to read this with some kind of relevance to their own situation, they should kind of, he would have been better off if he'd spent more time uh, talking about, uh, you know, well, processes of wage determination and what they might mean. But you also have to understand that in the same way that when Marx talks about the relationship between prices and value, that the price of labor power is always going to be quantitatively different from the value of labor power. That there are qualitative shifts uh, also, as he mentions, and uh, which which are going to turn up in terms of monopoly skills and things of that kind, which exist in the labor market, uh, and 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 so on. So he is. Uh, really trying to sort of say, look, in, in detail, there's going to be a lot of complexity of this kind, but on average, there's going to be an average wage rate of some kind. Uh, we basically deal with that by talking about a minimum wage. What is the, mi what is the minimum wage? And, and uh, beyond that, uh, of course, there are all kinds of variations which, which occur. Uh, but there is a share of labor in the national product uh, which de depends upon uh, you know, uh, the hourly wage. Uh, 
And actually, when you look in aggregate, as opposed to looking at you know, what's going on between you and your friends, if you look at aggregate, uh, you'll see that, uh, for instance, wages, real wages, have not actually moved very much for the whole mass of the population since the 1970s. In fact, if anything, uh, they've gone down. The share of labor and national income has gone down. We have these measures. Uh, Every uh, month, there is the you know the employment data comes out, uh, but there's an also a whole kind of survey on wage growth. And one of the confusing things in in, in the financial uh, services is to understand why the wage rate has not risen. Well, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's statistical data on, on remuneration, uh, hourly remuneration in the labor force in aggregate across the whole of the North America, United States. So if you look at that data, you, what you'll see is there's a fairly constant, you know, so there's not been much change in, in remuneration rate of, uh, of workers over since 2008, 2009, been hardly any change in the rate of remuneration. Now, that's the kind of thing that Marx, I think, is trying to get to, to, to analyze. Uh, in detail, yes, there'll be lots of variations and that, but still there's an aggregate kind of question. I mean, I think there's a, an interesting de debate to be had as to why it is that we're under conditions of relatively full employment, or at least a low wage, or a low, a low unemployment rate, which isn't the same as, you know, um, labour force participation rate and all the rest of it. But if you say, well, there's low rate of uh, un unemployment, then usually, and if there's low rate of unemployment, there's a pressure on wages and hourly re remuneration starts to go up. But we've seen a decline of the unemployment rate and no movement in remuneration of w w rate of, uh, of wage labour. So under those conditions, it seems to me what Marx is trying to say is to ask the question, why is that wage rate always at, a, at that, that kind of level? I mean, this is a kind of question that seems to be coming out of these chapters. And I think that then the question is, would be as to, this then comes back to go back into the chapter on labor, <coughs> the value of labor power and ask why is it remain constant? Why has it remained so constant over time when clearly Marx there talks about it, the possibility of it being variable depending upon the state of class struggle and all the rest of it. One of the answers to the wage question is, of course, uh, the diminished capacity for class struggle that has arisen with structures of labor and the, the, the attack upon union power and all, and, and the politics of uh, uh, all of that, the flexibilization of the labor force and, and, and the like. So, you, you know, you have to answer these questions, but Marx's point is, that in any capitalist mode of production, there's likely to be a, 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 a standard of, of wage rate uh, remuneration, uh, which is widespread and, and therefore uh, is the foundation for capitalist mode of production in general. Okay, we'll take a question from online. Um, we have this one from Daniel. In a footnote on page, on page 315, March mentions calculations of depreciation of constant capital, and this made me think of companies claiming depreciation for their machinery and other means of production. According to Marx's understanding of how the value of constant capital is transferred to commodities, can we consider tax breaks for depreciation of the means of production as a stealing of value? Yeah, the depreciation of, uh, of fixed capital. Um, in, in volume one of Capital, Marx tends to uh, adhere to what we call a straight line depreciation. <coughs> that if you have a, a, a machine which is uh, 
worth a hundred dollars uh, that uh, you dep and it's going to last you ten years then the de you depreciate one tenth of the value every year so there's a depreciation schedule on the machine um, there are other depreciation structures which can be set out now one of the things that uh, uh, capitalist politics does is to play a very special role for depreciation of machinery. One of the things that Reagan did uh, was to say that instead of uh, depreciating the value of machinery over 10 years, uh, you can take all of the depreciation in one year. Now, notice what this does is that if you've depreciated your machinery in one year, then you can actually go and get new machinery. So it actually accelerates uh, technological change. It also did some other things which uh, uh, meant that you could depreciate fixed capital in, in such a way as to reduce its value to zero and then you could move on. For instance, uh, one of the things that uh, Reagan's move on depreciation of fixed capital did uh, was to, in, a, in effect, subsidize the geographical le location of uh, American industry. Uh, in the 1970s, there was a lot of movement out of the Rust Belt into the Sun Belt. Uh, that was accelerated by accelerating the depreciation. So the depreciation on factories in Ohio could all be claimed back in one year, and therefore you had no reason to stay there anymore because you already uh, depreciated the value and got the value back then you could move to the Carolinas or to Texas or Arizona or wherever so so the depreciation of fixed capital is a uh, now whether this is a robbery of value or not um, to be honest I'm not quite sure how I would account for that uh, in terms of the value structures uh, what I would say is that any acceleration of uh, the recuperation of, uh, of, of value has to come from somewhere uh, and that therefore there is a redistribution of value uh, going on. Whether it's a robbery of value is another question. Uh, there's a redistribution of value uh, through taxation arrangements but then this is in effect what a lot of taxation arrangements are about which is about the redistribution of, of value via various mechanisms and if you look uh, at uh, the last tax bill and look at things like uh, depreciation but also look uh, at uh, you know various uh, uh, other aspects of allowing capital to write off investments at a faster rate if you look at all of that and what you would see is that there's a redistribution of value going on now. Whether it's a redistribution from workers or whether it's a redistribution from some capitalists to other capitalists, uh, I think you probably find a bit of both uh, involved. Uh, and, and so I think that this, you know, uh, the analysis of uh, 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 fixed capital depreciation uh, in Marx is, 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 is a little bit complicated because it really turns out that there are other methods of depreciation which might uh, might logically be involved but I don't think that Marx actually solved a lot of those problems uh, very very well in volume two of Capital uh, he set out to do so but uh, in my view it really didn't uh, didn't come up with uh, I think a sufficiently powerful uh, way of looking at at it because the, the value of, a, of an old machine is either the depreciated cost or it could be the replacement cost or it could be what it contributes to value creation through uh, the efficiency that it imparts to the labor process. So there are various ways in which you can actually start to look upon, upon the depreciation of machinery. We have one more online question. 
This is from Stephen Webster. In chapter nine, Marx develops his concept of rate of surplus value as a true measure of capitalist exploitation. Although he doesn't develop the concept of rate of profit here, it is the backdrop for his analysis of senior's last hour. But isn't profit and therefore rate of profit the necessary form of appearance of the return on investment under capitalist relations of production? In other words, isn't profit as a concept just a further extension of the fetishism Marx describes throughout capital? Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> I mean, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, we're coming towards uh, the kind of question of uh, the concept of profit versus the profit, uh, concept of rate of exploitation. Now, the rate of exploitation is S over V. The rate of profit is S over C plus V. And then there's a problem about the C. Is that the, the capital advanced or is it the capital used up? So the rate of profit, however, is what the capitalists work with. And the capitalists have to work with the rate of profit because you know, that's what the capitalist mode of production is about. And, there's a, there, and, and in, in pursuing uh, advantages in terms of the rate of profit, capitalists acting in their own self-interest are likely to produce technological mixes and so on which actually militate against uh, the expansion of the rate of surplus value. So that uh, there are contradictions, but these are very much taken up further down the line uh, in terms of the volume three analysis, particularly in the falling rate of profit. But I think that uh, here uh, we're beginning to see, particularly in, in this concept of C over V, which L Marx will later call the organic composition of capital, or the value composition of capital, which is a measure of capital intensity or labor intensity, whichever way you want to look at it, uh, that uh, these uh, features that Marx is defining here are going to be used and useful to him uh, in later, in later uh, analysis. We will come back to the rate of profit and develop some discussion of the rate of profit uh, in volume one of capital, but the main uh, discussion of that, of course, is in, in, in volume three of, uh, uh, of Capital. But, again, what Marx is doing here is kind of saying that there is a certain, well, I, I guess the, the term would be a certain necessary fetishism which involve, is involved here. That Capital has to uh, work on the nature of the rate of profit, not on the rate of surplus value even though the key figure, as far as Marx is concerned, is going to be the rate of surplus value. That, and, and, and actually it also becomes difficult, and this is you know, part of the difficulty on the other side, which is at what point in the day do, do, do workers start to realize that they may be working for the capitalist as opposed to reproducing their own value? And Marx's point is that that point is hidden. It's, it's necessarily hidden. And I mean, it's not as if uh, you're in a factory and you've worked for six hours and then suddenly a bell goes off and lights come up and say, okay, now you have reproduced the value of your labor power and from now on you're going to produce surplus value for the capitalist. Of course, the capitalist is not going <laughs> to tolerate anything like that, but it's actually very difficult uh, to for, for workers to see at, uh, the concept of exploitation. They know the general concept of exploitation, but what Marx is trying to do is to ex explain where that exploitation lies, and by setting up this conceptual apparatus, it's a simple uh, conceptual apparatus, uh, to try to kind of say, well, okay, there's a technical way in which we can understand that by setting up the rate of surplus value and saying, hey, this is the rate of exploitation, uh, which is a very good uh, way of thinking about the condition of the working class and under what r rates of exploitation uh, it has to reproduce itself. Yeah. Uh, in oh. in so-called uh, lights-out factories where the entire production process is automated, where is the value coming from? Well, well, to begin with, um, uh, 
you have to build the factory, so um, so there's a lot of constant capital involved in the operation, and somebody presumably has to mobilize that. There is a question of where the factory begins and where it ends, you know, and then if it's de highly dependent upon certain inputs, there will be labor inputs coming from outside. If you subcontract uh, people to service the equipment and all that kind of thing, well, so, so the, 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 the fantasy of a, of a completely laborless factory, I think you have to be quite careful about that. But one of the things that Marx does in volume three of Capital is to point out that uh, whenever there is an equalization of the rate of profit, uh, there is a technical reason why subsidy will flow from labor intensive sectors to capital intensive sectors that in a free market situation where there's no interventions or anything kind, then uh, labor intensive, the value created in labor intensive uh, uh, sectors of the economy will flow to those sectors which are highly automated. Because that's what the rate of profit is about. And with that, when, when, that, when that happens, and this, by the way, happens between countries, that uh, a, a free market uh, will always end up with uh, a flow of value moving from labor-intensive countries to capital-intensive uh, economies, which is why capital-intensive economies are always in favor of uh, f you know, free trade. And, and free markets. So if that's the case, then it's perfectly possible uh, for a highly automated uh, sector of the economy uh, to be supported by a flow of value uh, from other sectors which are labor intensive. Now, part of the argument about the falling rate of profit is that that then leads to, uh, if we start to automate all everything, then there's a real, real problem. But I think of it this way: that, yeah, uh, the increasing um, uh, automation of and, mach and machine production of uh, say automobiles in the automobile industry uh, or uh, in steel production. Uh, I mean, I recall uh, when I first went to Baltimore, there was a steel plant deployed about, I don't know, 37,000 people or something like that. By the time you get to 1990, it's employing 5,000 people and it's producing the same amount of steel. And then you kind of say, well, what's happened to the value? Uh, well, there's a lot of value transfer uh, going on. It turned out in that case it wasn't enough, so it all ended up. But at the same time that's going on, uh, we're getting a huge increase in uh, uh, activities like uh, oh yeah, McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken and all that kind of stuff. And while we don't like to think of that maybe on the same par as the automobile manufacturer, in fact, there was this huge increase in this very labor-intensive activities in fast food production. So that the biggest corporations in the world now are putting things like McDonald's and, 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 and the like. And, you know, so, so actually what you, what, you, what you would then surmise is that the, the value is being produced in the McDonald's uh, hamburger joints, and, uh, but a lot of it is flowing to those high-tech sectors <laughs> that are employing hardly any, any labor. Um, but then there are other issues, of course. Uh, 
for instance, uh, to what degree do we as users actually now participate in the creation of, of Google's value? And the answer is that a lot of the information we apply by our activities in Google is part of the, uh, of the value which uh, uh, Google is recuperating. So we have to be careful and looking at where value is being produced, where it's flowing to, how it's being appropriated, and there are different mechanisms of uh, uh, appropriation. Um, but you would then go back, I would always go back to the basics and start to talk about, you know, okay, where's the constant and the, the variable and the, the surplus value and where's it coming from, and then look at uh, the equalization of the rate of profit and how that transfers value and what that might mean. Uh, in terms of the structure of an economy in general. You'll find Marx moving in his way of thinking from individual commodities and the production of individual commodities, which we tend to look at here. Later in Volume 1, you move to a, a more macro aggregate uh, analysis, which is looking at the whole economy. Uh, and the relationship between classes and uh, that sort of thing rather than uh, looking at individual commodities. Right now we're using the individual commodity to try to develop some of the basic concepts which are then going to be put to use in understanding uh, the economy as a whole. Thank you. Good evening. Is my question is related with chapter number seven and specifically with the category of activity. So I was wondering why in the chapters that are developing the concept of surplus value production, Marx begins with this concept of activity related always with the production of use value elements. So I was wondering if it will be possible today to rethink this category as a critical instance against the fetishization, fetishization of labor, for instance, in order to rethink socialism not like based on state reproduction and capitalist reproduction, but to open a critical movements or even to rethink the, the, the concept of communism from the possibilities of activity as liberating activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think this is very, you know, very, very interesting uh, observation and, and question. Marx is a, a, a person who is going to emphasize process. Uh, he's, he's very much into things like the form giving fire of labor. Uh, I don't know how you felt about the first seven or eight pages of the chapter on the labor process. I think this, I mean, my, my reading of it is that there's, there's almost a, a, a certain kind of hint of romanticism about, there's something noble about the labor process. And I think there's a sort of contrast between, uh, you know, the notion of the form giving fire of the labor process that all, all human societies are creating themselves by transforming the world and transforming self and we're into uh, a world of where the imagination can work and so on and and there's a certain kind of nobility about the labor process uh, until you get to that phrase of now let's go back to our would-be capitalist to see what happens to that concept of the labor process, which is, I think, a little bit romanticized, but I think, you know, I'm all in favor of a bit of romanticization. I, it, I, there, there's a contrast he, he's drawing between, between that world with all of its possibilities and all of its, you know, uh, richness and, 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 and uh, transformative uh, possibilities, even though it's hard work and we don't think it's just about play, you know. So, so there's a contrast between that and now let's return to our would-be capitalist and we start to see the way in which the, 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 the labourer is denied uh, any of that nobility because they do not have control over the labour process, they don't control the product, 
They, they don't control the surplus value which is taken away from them. So in a sense, you know, a lot of people would have often said that Marx leaves behind the concept of alienation. But I think actually this is the concept of alienation. This is alienated labor. Uh, and therefore the notion of socialism and communism is about getting back to the, nobility, the potential nobility of labor and uh, all, all of the ideas that are in there in that first seven or eight you know, pages and saying, okay, we can build an alternative society. Which is why I think he's at that point invoking this, I, this point about what separates the worst of architects from, from the best of bees is that the architect erects things in imagination. We imagine something different. This is Marx, I think, talking about a utopian moment in any kind of transformative politics. So I think that that chapter is, is very much about. And I think the contrast between the opening part, which is written in a certain kind of style, uh, which, is, which is materialist, but at the same time, uh, there's, uh, like I say, there's something noble about, about the, the possibilities and, the, and, 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 and creativity and transformative capacities there. And, and then what follows when, when the worker is actually has to submit to the disciplinary apparatus of the, of, the, of the capitalist and do the capitalist bidding, which is about doing nothing more noble than producing surplus value for the capitalist. So I think that, 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 that Marx, however, wants always to insist that the live activity of the worker, the animal spirits of the worker, the, the, the creative fire of the worker has to be mobilized by capital. And, and that then means that you cannot, uh, in, you know, at the end of the day, you cannot kill uh, all of that creativity or that capacity. You've, 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 you, the, the, the capitalist is always faced with a dilemma of how to keep the lid on it, how to keep the discipline of it, so that that labor does not flow back into the kind of thing that Marx is beginning to evoke uh, in the first part of uh, the, the labor process chapter, but I, but I think that this is where the politics, you're right, this is where the politics of what Marx is doing, uh, uh, this is where the politics arises. And the, and, the, and the alternative vision of how would we arrange a labor process, uh, what would we do uh, you know, with a, in a communist world, uh, and in a sense the, 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 the tragedy of some of the labor process uh, work which has come out of uh, you know what happened in uh, say Russia or what happened in the Soviet Union what is current happening in China you know poses these problems continues to pose these these problems as to what a communist socialist world would look like but you certainly find Marx saying it's not going to look like the one that Fourier uh, had in mind it's not going to be just about you know uh, perpetual play and and, and 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 the like. Professor, would you mind letting us know the readings for next week? Uh, we're going to do the chapter on the working the working day, which is a long historical uh, empirical chapter, but we'd also want to do the the two short chapters that follow on from that. Uh, so the working day. Uh, and then uh, uh, the chapter on uh, the rate and mass of surplus value, and yeah, just the rate and mass of surplus value. I guess it is. Yeah. So chapters ten and eleven. The working day is not. Uh, uh, a chapter which is theoretically, uh, the theoretical part of the chapter is fairly short, but it's uh, an interesting historical uh, study. And I think it, you know, just to alert you, um, people would ask, often mar uh, sort of say of Marx's theory, where's your proof of what you're saying? And I think in part the chapter on the working day is really set out as a kind of a proof that what he's saying is, 
you know, meaning, meaningful in relationship to interpreting what the labour process actually looks like on the ground. And there's a lot of historical materials in here and also some neat observations of class relations in Britain uh, around the time of the, of the Factory Acts and the, uh, and the struggle over the length of the working day. So chapters 10 and 11 for next week. Okay? Should we leave it there? Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>